but today we're going to be talking about light. So we should probably answer the question of what is light. That would be a reasonable question to ask. Uh, so <clears throat> just as a little bit of a backstory, um, in the 1800s, a fellow named James Clark Maxwell, it's spelled Clerk, but it's pronounced Clark because he was Scottish. Um, <clears throat> he showed the following thing is true about electromagnetic waves. He showed that electromagnetic waves, and those are waves that uh, propagate, or, or rather he showed that electric fields and magnetic fields together, so let me rephrase. Electric and magnetic fields together satisfy the following equation. Where say F is the is the magnitude of the electric field, for example. And so hopefully you guys recognize at this point that that is the wave equation, right? So this implies that there are such things as electromagnetic waves. And it turns out, uh, in this case, we can solve for the speed relatively easily. It's one over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. And you don't really have to know what this epsilon naught mu naught is. You'll, you'll learn that in 9c. Um, it turns out that this number, those are just two constants, is equal to 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So in, by doing this, James Clark Maxwell showed that this thing, which this type of wave, which is composed of electric and magnetic fields oscillating in unison, has the exact same speed as the, as the speed that they measured light to travel at. Because at this point, light had already been, the speed of light had already been determined, but they didn't know what it was. So this, let, this is basically evidence that electromagnetic waves are light. And so if someone asks you, what is light, you can just say, it's an electromagnetic wave. It is a wave composed, or the, the disturbance that the wave measures, or that the wave describes, is a disturbance in the electromagnetic field. And that propagates at a particular speed. It propagates at the speed of light. So <clears throat> we know that waves have some features. And so we can perhaps then characterize those features as they pertain to light. So waves typically travel through a medium. Sound waves travel through the air. Displacement waves on a string travel through a string. However, light can travel. So light can travel through a lot of media, just like sound. But it can also travel through none, through no media, through a vacuum. So one of the things that was, or one of the experiments that proved this is a famous experiment in physics known as the michelson morley experiment. Um, basically what they did is they assumed light traveled through a medium. And then they said, well, if, if Earth is moving relative to this medium, because assume maybe the Earth is just, maybe this medium permeates all of space. Well, the Earth is going around the sun. So that means that the Earth is going to be moving relative to the medium. So if we can figure out a way to measure the change in light speed, relative to us, because the Earth is moving through that medium, we could show that such a medium exists. And they, indeed, they found that it doesn't matter what direction or what speed the Earth is moving in, light will always travel at the same speed. And that is indicative of the fact that there is no medium through which the Earth is moving that the, uh, wave that the light wave travels through. Um, and this, this experiment eventually led to Einstein's relativity, which makes it a pretty groundbreaking experiment. Um, <clears throat> Other features of waves is that they describe a disturbance. What is the thing doing the waving? So the things that are waving are not physical things at all. It is the electric and magnetic fields.
that so so these fields oscillate from having a value of zero to having a value of non-zero, and that propagates through space. And you'll learn about what fields are um, again in 9C. Take my word. This is just a thing that permeates all space. There's an electric field at every point in space, a magnetic field at every point in space. They're basically vectors. And um, the value that those vectors take on at different positions in different times oscillate when the light wave pa passes through. That is what the light wave is. Um, the last thing that we haven't really talked about a whole lot is polarization. This is transverse or longitudinal. It turns out that like a, like a displacement wave, um, light waves are transversely polarized. And the way we determine that is we just say, look, what direction does the electric field point in when it's increasing and decreasing? That is how we define the, pol the polarization direction. We just look at the direction that the electric field points in. Elec transversely polari polarized by the E field. And again, you'll learn about all of these things in 9C, but it's useful to know to have some uh, basic knowledge of how these things are polarized. So you cannot have transversely polarized light. That's a fundamental fact of nature. So um, I actually will just show you a picture of my notes because there's a nifty picture that's in them. Um, let's see. So this is kind of what's going on in, I don't know if this is inverted or not, or how, how good the quality is. But this is kind of what's going on in a light wave, right? So you have arrows that, the, these, uh, these arrows that are pointing up, those are the electric field and it's move and the arrows that are pointing sideways, those are the magnetic field. And so just think of these as vectors at every point in space that are increasing and decreasing in magnitude as the light wave propagates through it. Notice that the, both the electric and the magnetic field are both perpendicular to the direction of propagation. That's how you know that it's transversely polarized. And again, that, that image is going to be in the notes. So if you didn't, if you don't want to draw it or something, that's fine. You'll be able to reference it in the lecture notes that I post. Finally, um, and importantly regarding light, we perceive light. So we detect the intensity of electromagnetic waves, just like how we detect the intensity of sound waves. And the keyword here is intensity, right? We don't detect the magnitude or the amplitude. We detect the intensity. So, I mean, obviously you don't use the same organs for these, but if the intensity drops by a factor of two, then what we perceive or the well, that's, even that's not true because the way we perceive sound and light, they're both logarithmic, but uh, it's not the amplitude that matters. It's the intensity of the light. Um, further, regarding perception, uh, frequency, the frequency of the light, so frequency of sound tells us higher or lower pitch, right? The frequency of the light, because it is a wave, tells us the color, at least in the visible range. By the way, I will be referring to all electromagnetic waves as light, um, light that we can see visible, is visible light. And so it turns out that higher frequencies, meet the higher frequencies above the visible range, that would be things like UV light and X-rays and gamma rays. The lower frequencies would be things like infrared radiation or IR light, uh, microwaves, also a form of light, and radio waves, also a form of light, just light that we can't see. Just think they're extra red. That's infrared really means um, beyond red. It was actually discovered because somebody noticed that there was, well, when we talk about prisms, I'll tell you this experiment. It's nifty. So the, those are the characteristics of a wave. We, we have some way of perceiving them. Um, in particular, we perceive the frequency. And by the way, keep in mind that the frequency, because uh, light travels at a constant rate, the frequency of the, and the wavelength are very closely related, but they're just related by a constant. So you can completely characterize a light wave by its frequency. You don't have to talk about wavelength at all. But you'll actually find me talking about wavelength pretty frequently because that's the, uh, 
I got into a hobby when I was younger that involved lasers. And so that was the colloquial language that was used to describe, um, this isn't still on, is it? Uh, the colloquial, colloquial language that was used to describe uh, various frequencies of light. We talked about their wavelength. Right. So I'm going to tell you about a new phenomenon, which is true for all waves or for all uh, multidimensional waves. But it's particularly interesting and particularly uh, obvious, maybe, when we talk about light. So I'm going to tell you about Huygens' principle. I think he was Dutch. So Huygens' principle is just a statement. It's kind of like one of those experimental laws where it's just, here's something that we observed that seems to be true. And it is the following. I'm going to write this word for word. Every wave propagates. Every wave propagates by having every point on a wave front. And I'll draw a picture of this in a minute, but I just want to get this depth of this uh, language out. Every point on a wave front act as an independent generator of another spherical wave. And so, by the way, this, this principle, this is a mathematical fact. It's, um, it's just a way of describing a wave mathematically. Uh, so it acts at every point on a wave front acts as an independent generator of another spherical wave. And the observed wave is just the consequence of the interference of all of those waves. So the picture here is, imagine that you have um, a spherical wave. So it's coming out. This is just one side of a spherical wave, right? So uh, it, it would be shaped like this or something. The, I'm drawing, the say, the peaks. The, those describe the thing called the wave front. So what happens is you treat every point. I drew this way too big. Um, I'm only going to draw that many. You treat every point on the wave front as another source of spherical waves. So each of these will emit a wave like this. Notice, so they all have wave fronts coming out. And then you can see where, where do all the peaks align? They all align where the next wave front would be. And, and you could continue this drawing. But the point is, is the, the peaks will, every time you have a peak, if you imagine that at that location, there is another peak that's emitted one period later, then all of those peaks will align where the original peak, sorry, one wavelength further than the original peak. And you can prove this rigorously and mathematically, but it's just a way of uh, visualizing how uh, waves propagate. And it seems kind of arcane and arbitrary, but it explains something very strange about waves. In particular, it explains diffraction. And in fact, it's going to explain almost everything that we're going to talk about when it comes to uh, wave interference or light wave interference. So because of Huygens' principle, not Huygens, Huygens, waves can bend around corners, which is strange. And by the way, this still applies to sound waves too. It's just strange that it occurs for light waves as well. So the picture here is, um, and let me try to draw this. It's always hard to draw. So say you have a source. Let me, let's say you have a wall here, and you have a source that's emitting wave fronts, right? And a wall or something like that. Now, typically, you wouldn't be able to get any waves past this line, right? But that's just not true. In fact, like you can, like people can hear me around the corner in my house because sound waves bend as well. So what we do is we use Huygens' principle: treat all of these points on the wavefront as new spherical sources. So you'll have one source, and they'll they'll just be emitted. So you have one source like that, another source like this, 
It's centered there. Another source centered here. And so, I mean, it's, it's hard to draw well, but uh, the point is, is that what you'll end up with is, let me move this so that I have more room to draw. What you end up with is you end up with waves that are propagating like this now, later on. And so what's, what's happened is you've, ended, you've bypassed this corner somehow. And this is called diffraction, where you have light or sound bending around corners. And it's 100% it's due to Huygens principle. And in fact, Huygens principle is also responsible for um, another type of interesting interference uh, called double slit interference. You can describe most types of interferences Huygens, using Huygens, Huygens principle. Double slit interference is a little bit more obvious, though. And um, we can actually do a demo of it, which I will do in a sec. So, but first, I need to describe it. So double slit interference is a way of producing the type of interference that we expect from like um, sound waves, right? So we rem remember that when we want to produce an interference like between two speakers, like where you have uh, loud and quiet spots, what we do is we, we set up two speakers and we put them in different places. In the case of light, well, we'd like to do the same, but it's kind of hard. So those two sources, they have to be in phase with each other, meaning that they have the same source. And they also have to have the same frequency. And so it's not quite as easy as just sticking two light bulbs next to each other. But if we made each of these points on the wave front, the individual news source is now extremely small and close to one another, wouldn't there just become a giant jumbled blob of new waves in every direction? Uh, no. So what happens is you'll have destructive interference sometimes and constructive interference other times. And you can prove that rigorously mathematically. Um, the idea is you actually, you actually do have to take the limit. If you just use a few points, it's not enough. You, you, you do have to take the limit, but it's hard to draw it, hard to draw an infinite number of points, right? Um, <clears throat> But no, it doesn't become just a giant blobs of new waves because every time a peak lines up with a trough, you would get nothing. Um, and so you'll get, you get a lot of cancellation occurring and you just get, get this nice, nice, neat new wave front one, wa one, one uh, wavelength further away. Um, and I'm not going to prove that mathematically here. It's, it's not easy, but it's doable. So I would suggest looking it up um, if you're curious anyway. So right, so I was talking about uh, this. Uh, to source interference. And unfortunately, so, so we can do that with a sound wave, with sound waves really easy. You take two speakers, you connect them both to the same wire, so they have the same, so they emit the same frequency and they start in phase. And then you just move them around and you'll get two source interference at various places. The trouble is the standard source of light that we use, a light bulb, they don't satisfy either of these conditions. Light bulbs don't work for this. Now, um, the reason for that depends on the type of light bulb. But for the old type of light bulb, where they just heat a piece of metal up really hot and then it emits light, the easiest way to see why it doesn't work is that, uh, and we'll talk about this once we get to thermodynamics, is when things, the reason why hot things emit light is because you have their electrons moving in, moving randomly all over the place. And so when those electrons uh, move, when they change direction effectively, they emit some light. But because it's random motion, the light waves that are emitted from the, uh, from the light bulb are emitted at random times, and they have random frequencies. And so they're not going to be in phase with each other. What we need is we need a source that's monochromatic, meaning one color. Or we need two sources that are, that are identical in frequency. Um, <clears throat> and we also need a source of light where all of the waves are in phase with each other. It's not enough to just use an LED because even though an LED will produce all of the same wave or all just one frequency, 
What it won't do is it won't produce waves of the same frequency that are all lined up with each other. We need something that is called a coherent light source. Coherent just means, um, it basically just means all of the waves coming from the source are in phase with each other and all of the waves are the same frequency. Uh, that's basically the, I mean, it has more technical definitions, but that's, that's enough. Um, and so there is basically a name for all sources of coherent light. These are called lasers. By the way, I did not capitalize because I'm excited. I capitalized because it's an acronym, Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Um, most people don't know that, and I, I won't capitalize it anymore after this, but LASER is indeed an acronym. Uh, there is such a thing as a MASER, which is Microwave Amplified by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. It's basically just a microwave laser. The more you know, by the way, you can find, you, you can, uh, find MASERs effectively in your microwave. Um, now, how, or how and or why lasers are coherent sources of light is kind of outside the scope of this course. Just a true statement, Unfa unfortunate but true statement. Um, lasers are really neat and laser science is really cool, but uh, we're not here to talk about electron orbitals and all that business. We're here to talk about waves and lasers are just a very convenient source of those waves. Now, you guys all know that lasers emit a single color, right? Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that, first of all, it means that there's not a range of color, I mean, there is, there is, but there's not a large range of colors over which that light is emitted. You may have seen diagrams like this, where you have like um, something, and then this might describe 3,700K light. And, in, and what that means is they're basically plotting wavelength or frequency, and this tells you how much of that frequency is present in that light source. Lasers are not like that. Lasers are like this, a single peak meaning that it's just one wavelength or one frequency of light that's present in that light source. And further, all of those waves are uh, coherent. They are all in phase with each other. The trouble is, is we need two sources. We st our goal is still to produce this sort of two, uh, this sort of uh, two source interference effect where you have loud regions and quiet regions in sound. For light, it would be bright regions and dark regions. So the question is, is how do we get two in-phase in phase coherent sources? So a laser emits one beam. All of those are in phase with each other, but we need two beams. How do we do that? Or two sources? Because we need them to interfere with each other, right? They won't interfere with themselves because they're all in phase. They're not going to destructively interfere anywhere. The way we do this is relatively easy, actually. We take the laser, or take a single laser, and split it. This is basically like taking an electrical wire and splitting the signal to go to two separate, two separate speakers. They start off, uh, the signals, are the, or the originating source of those sound waves come from the same thing just like how the originating light from a split laser beam come from the same source. So they will stay in phase with each other and they'll still be coherent and they'll still be monochromatic. And so we can then use the split laser and have it self interfere. So, what we, so the way we do this is with Huygens principle. So you have some laser, draw a picture of a laser, or draw a picture of the setup. And it's going to emit a beam, you know, as, as they do. And then you take a sheet of paper, or a sheet of something anyway. And you make it so that there's two small gaps. This is where the double slit name comes from, by the way. And so because, so imagine that this, this laser is emitting wave fronts, clearly not to scale, right? Now, some of those wave fronts are just going to be bl completely blocked by the, uh, by the material, whatever the material is that, that we're putting in front of the laser. However, some of that wave front, part of the wave front here, part of the wave front here, those will just act as point sources, as Huygens, princi Huygens principle tells us. So what we're left with is we're left with 
those two points split by the double slit emitting light. And now there's just two sources. Now we can just treat this as two identical sources. They started out in phase, so they're still in phase. And they're emitting coherent same frequency light. And so now we can see what happens when you get constructive versus destructive interference. And if the lines that I've drawn are points of uh, alternating constructive and destructive interference, then this point here, because that's say the second, uh, that's the second point. So from, from this wave that I'm pointing to now, it emits one and, and then it emits, well, that, that's the second one that, that came out, is intersecting with the first wave of the other one. So that would be a dark spot because you have, uh, you have uh, a peak and then a trough and then a peak and then a trough. Whereas when the uh, second points, when the second waves emitted of both overlap, you'd have a bright spot because you have two peaks overlapping. And so you, you would, so if you put a piece of paper here, you would see eventually some dark spots and some light spots. I'll draw the light spots and dark spots. You'd see basically blobs on the piece of paper that would, some of them would be bright because that's where the waves have traveled the same distance or a distance differing by one or more wavelengths. And then some places where the, where the light or where there's no light because the waves, the two sources have traveled say half a wavelength or three halves of a wavelength different. So the, the idea, uh, just to summarize, is <coughs> those is we take a, a bleh, 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 we take a light source and both of and we split it using Huygens principle. And the reason why those light sources are still in phase is because those light sources have traveled the same distance. So initially they started out in phase when they were at the when they came out of the laser, and then those point waves travel the same distance to get to the to get to the two slits. So they're still in phase there. And then we can just treat them as two completely identical sources and then we get interference. So what I have is I have a demo for you. So here's a laser that I, let me see if I can set this up so you can see better. Right, so unfortunately, this is a laser that's a, a little bit more cobbled together. I kind of assembled it myself. Uh, you'll notice that the wiring's not great. Um, and there's this switch box that I had to build myself because you know I, I don't have a professional budget for these kinds of things. And then I just ordered an AC adapter from China uh, for 12 bucks. So I don't know if you guys can see this. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to turn it on, and I'll show you what the laser looks like if you haven't seen one. This is actually a very special kind of laser. That's why I uh, own it to begin with. Um, this is a laser that's not like the standard laser that you will see in a uh, laser pointer, right? This is a really long tube. It's not because it's powerful. It's because it's special. So um, I should, I should sharing your screen so we could see your um, demo. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you can see it better now. Um, yes, yeah, you could have also just double clicked on my picture, but I don't need to share my screen and it'll probably eat away at my something or other. Right, so laser, um, pardon the, uh, the kitchen, I guess. Um, so first let's just see what it looks like when I just turn it on. So I'm gonna flip the switch. Oh, it's unplugged. I should plug it in, turn it off. not my best production, but it just has to work. So let me move this chair out of the way and angle the camera just a little bit. Right. So here you have <clears throat> a source of light. It's kind of hard to see. Let me get a uh, something dark. Kind of blurry. Uh, I stick this here, you'll see that it's just a small dot. 
Now, this is like a, I don't know how well the color comes through, but this, this laser has a very, a very particular wavelength. It's produced by exciting electrons in a gas, and so there's a long tube of gas inside the, uh, the laser. It has a wavelength of 543.5 nanometers. Now, I can say that much precision because it's not 543 plus or minus five nanometers. It's a very, very, you guys can't see me. It's a very, very narrow band of light. Hence, we can call it monochromatic. Um, and you can produce lasers effectively of whatever frequency you want. It just requires changing your materials and using semiconductors occasionally. This one is a particularly nice sample, though, because A, it's not easy to come by this color, and B, it produces a very, very clean dot, uh, whereas semiconductor lasers do not. Um, so the question is, is what happens when I uh, put a double slit in front of it? Now, I don't have a double slit. I tried to make one before a uh, lecture, and that's what I was spending my time doing instead of uh, being on Discord. However, what I can do is I can take a piece of hair. I don't know if you can see this. It's, this is my hair. Oh, sorry, it's curly. I can take a piece of hair. And the idea is a double slit, all it is, is you're just blocking one side, right? Or you're just blocking out the middle. So if I put this piece of hair in the middle of the laser beam, that would effectively make two sources on either side. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. This, this will actually model a, a two combined phenomena, but it'll demonstrate the effect close enough. Uh, so let me get this chair out of the way. Um, let me turn off the lights. And let's see if I can get this to work. So what I'm doing is I'm effectively putting a double slit in the way of the laser. By the way, this laser is not dangerous in any respect. Ah, there we go. I don't know how well this is coming through. Actually, let me move the camera up so you can see it a little bit better. Let's just put the camera on top of the laser, maybe. Oh, come on. Let me get another hair. So as it, so that little flash that you're seeing, Oh, is basically the hair getting in the way. Oh, it's not coming through very well. I think it's too bright for the webcam. Um, let me try one more, one more way. I don't know if you guys can see the individual little bumps that are coming off the side. I don't think you can, though. I think that the center is too, probably too bright. <clears throat> All right, that's a bummer. Um, oh, hand in the way. Yeah, OK, not, not great. It's very impressive in person when you can actually see these things, uh, but it doesn't work apparently for this setup. So I'll turn it off and I'll just draw a picture instead. Uh, let me close the shutter so that nobody hurts themselves and so that the laser's lens doesn't get in the way. All right, so I'll draw a picture instead. Sorry about that. I was hoping that that would be more impressive and more neat. As you can maybe tell, I do have a high affinity or a, an interest in lasers. So what you should have seen is you should have seen viewing it from the front. If I have, oh, can you guys see my screen all right? OK, and sounds OK? I'll take that as a yes. So if that's the hair and the laser is coming at the piece of paper, you would, you would expect to see a bright spot, Bright spot, bright spot, bright spot, bright spot, bright spot, and so on, going on. And the bright spots will actually get wider as you go on, but eventually they'll get too dim and we won't be able to see them anymore. But that's what we would have expected to see. Unfortunately, we didn't see that because of reasons. Um, but perhaps it's not surprising, right? Imagine you have the light coming in on either side, like this, right? 
or rather you have a light source on either side. And so the light that comes from the left and the light that comes from the right, they're going to interfere at the center and produce constructive interference because they will have traveled the same distance. But at a later point, when this, when the light from the, let me draw it in green actually, that's not a, I should do that just so you can see. So you have your light source coming in uh, like this. Light source, light source. So the, the light that gets to the center will have traveled the same distance by both of them because it's symmetric, right? The light that gets to here, well, the light from the other source will have traveled half a wavelength further. And so you'll get destructive interference. But when the light gets to the second bright spot, you'll have constructive interference again. And that, that process will oscillate, or not oscillate, will repeat itself. Um, Every time the, the left source travels half a wavelength or three halves of a wavelength or whatever further than the right weight, than the right source, you get destructive interference and vice versa. So that's why you get bright and dark spots. And there are a whole bunch of probably excellent videos on YouTube about this. I just wanted to see if I could make a demo work myself. And the result was that I couldn't. So let's do some geometry and figure out how this works explicitly, get some formulas for it. this chair back. Right. So let me do some scrolling. Let's talk about geometry of the double slit. And by the way, the reason why it was so hard to make is because, uh, well, actually, we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, I just realized that, oh, uh, well, I might have to amend the homework because we don't have lecture on Friday. Anyway, I might amend the homework. We'll see. Um, right, so I'm going to draw a picture of a double slit. It's an idealized scenario. So we have one source of light here, one source of light here. They're coherent. They're initially in phase and everything. We'll call this distance here D, the distance between the two slits. And so let's put a screen where the light can project to, um, say, a distance L away. And I'm going to draw the, mid, the midline. This distance here is L. Those are just the standard letters that we use. And the light travels to the right. Goes that way, right? So the idea here is we want to know, for a given angle that one of the light beams travels, or say both of the light beams travel, say that angle. And by the way, this is very much not to scale um, because the slits have to be much, much, much smaller than the length. Um, maybe we call this angle theta 2 and this angle theta 1. And maybe we parameterize our coordinate as y going up. So this would be at 0, and then the y value increases going up and decreases going down, just so we have a way to mathematically talk about this. Right. So we can use trig to learn things about this setup. So <clears throat> first, we know that the tangent of theta 1, well, that should be equal to, say, let me make sure that I'm referring to the right thing. That would be maybe equal to delta y minus d over 2 over l. And the tangent of theta 2 would be equal to delta y plus d over 2 over l. So let's go do some trig and try to understand what these equations are, right? So the idea here is that this distance is delta y. And for the top slit, the top slit starts off at delta y, or the, the top slit, the, the height of that triangle is delta y minus d over 2, right? The bottom slit is delta y plus d over 2, um, because d is, is the distance between them, and the center is at the center. And then we divide by the length. So the trig makes sense so far. 
So what does that tell us? It tells us that the tangent of theta 1 minus the tangent of theta 2 equals d over l. OK, useful fact. So um, now we're going to make some assumptions. So first, let's assume that d is significantly smaller than l. When I, so that, that double less than sign, what that means is it means orders of magnitude smaller. So in this case, d is usually on the order of millimeters or less. L is usually on the orders of centimeters, tens of centimeters, perhaps meters. Um, that's how you would get the most dramatic effect. By having the, the larger d is, the smaller d is relative to L, the better the effect you'll get. So what does that imply? Well, that implies that the term that's d over 2 over L means that that's very small, which implies that the tangent of theta 1 is approximately the tangent of theta 2. So we can also see that from this equation. If d is significantly less than l, then tangent of theta 1 minus tangent of theta 2 is basically 0. And so you get that these, these two quantities are equal. Now, based off of the uh, series or the Taylor series expansion of the tangent, this basically tells us that theta 1 is basically equal to theta 2. And so we're just going to call it theta. So again, for any d much, much, much smaller than l, um, this will generally be true, where the, the theta 1 and theta 2 are the same angle. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's a useful fact, <clears throat> because we're going to need that fact in order to do any sorts of calculations. Otherwise, the, the calculations get significantly messier. You can do them, but it's just not worth it. So now let's go back to the picture. I'm going to try to get, get rid of as much uh, extraneous things as I can. So let's say that we're at a position y. This is 0. This position is y. So we have some angle here, some angle here. They're basically the same angle. And so we can actually draw a line from the midpoint. That was a very not straight line. Draw a line from the midpoint. Apologies for the terrible drawing. And then by doing some clever ge geometric trickery, if we drop a perpendicular, Here, not a perpendicular, sorry. Um, it's perpendicular to the, uh, to the middle line. Then we form an isosceles triangle. This triangle here is approximately isosceles. How do I spell isosceles? Isosceles? You guys know what an isosceles triangle are. Both sides are the same. And then these angles will also have to be approximately the same. And so, and this angle we could call theta. That's the, that's the angle between the, uh, the two beams. It's, it's theta 1 and theta 2 are both theta. And the reason why we're doing this is because this triangle, one side of that triangle, this distance here, that's delta x. That's how much further one of the beams traveled than the other beam. And that's the important part. Because in isosceles triangle, the sides are the same length. So after, the, after this bottom beam has traveled delta x distance, then it travels the same distance as the top beam. And that's, that's the important bit. That's the takeaway here. So zooming in on that triangle, we get something like this. So we have, you can do some trig and find that, find that that is equal to theta. This is the distance between the slits, d, and this is delta x. And so from that triangle, we get the following equation, that d sine theta is equal to delta x. And so that means that given an angle theta, given an angle, and that angle will correspond to a position on the screen, we get that the path difference between the two beams, or the two sources, is delta x, which is d sine theta. And you obviously need to know what the distances between the slits. So that means that the phase difference, remember that the phase difference, if they are in phase and they were turned on at the same time, the phase difference, which is usually just 2 pi delta x over lambda, we now can plug in d sine theta for delta x. So now, I know that this is pretty math heavy, but uh, it's important to get to the results. This is the first like big math 
calculation that we do to derive something. But remember, physics is about using math to understand the world. So just as a, as a thing to remind yourself about, constructive interference, constructive interference, I can say words, occurs when the relative phase or the relative total phase is, which is equal to two pi delta x over lambda, is equal to zero or two pi or four pi, et cetera, right? So what is the, so we can write that as just two pi n, where n is an integer. <clears throat> so that 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 means that we can relate the locations where you get constructive interference, bright spots, to the angle that they make with the center line relative to the uh, yeah relative to the source. So I'm going to put that in terms of equations. We get that 2 pi, so delta x is d sine theta, divided by lambda has to be equal to 2 pi n. So constructive interference implies this equation. And so rearranging, you get that you get constructive interference when d sine theta is equal to n lambda. And so this tells us where the bright spots are. So scrolling up, basically, if you want to figure out if, uh, for example, let's say you're interested in uh, where the bright spots, if there's a bright spot five centimeters away from the center. Well, you'd get out your ruler, you'd measure off five centimeters, and then you'd measure how far away is your source from your, uh, how far away is your source from your screen, that's L. And then you can find out what theta is based off of the value that you've chosen for y, five centimeters, and the value for l. And then you plug in, is, is, it, is it true that d sine theta is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength? If so, you would have a bright spot there. If not, you don't have a bright spot. Uh, similarly, we can do the same sort of calculation for destructive interference. And so we get that uh, for dark spots, we get dark spots occurring when d sine theta is equal to n plus a half lambda. Basically, when one of them travels uh, one half or three halves or five halves of a wavelength. Um, ah, OK, so this, so this is a two-dimensional thing that we're modeling. Um, you're talking about, right, OK, that, that's actually a very good question. But the point is, is the slits that we draw are vertical. So, or the slits that we make are things like this. Um, <clears throat> and so you get no interference in the vertical direction. So you just get, so if those are the slits that we would get, we would get a bright spot here, 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 and so on. And that's because the interference pattern is occurring in the horizontal plane because there's separation in the horizontal plane. If you don't have separation in the vertical, in the vertical plane, then you don't get uh, any interference in the vertical plane. So really, imagine what's happening as you have a whole bunch of points that are all interfering together, but they're stacked up vertically. It's a good question, though. I'm going to erase this because it's kind of not clear what I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> so we can simplify our calculation even easier. If we're looking for dark or bright spots, um, let me write bright or dark spots at small angles. Meaning, let's say that we don't want to, we, we're not really interested in if there's a bright spot at 30 degrees off axis, because those are going to be pretty dim anyway. What if we're interested in whether there's a bright spot one degree or two degrees off of axis? Well, then we can make the approximation where sine of theta is approximately tangent of theta which is equal to y over l for theta is less than one, or significantly less than one. So that allows us to simplify our bright spot or dark spot formulas. And again, this is only true for, for uh, small angles. So the nth bright spot will occur at when y sub n is equal to n lambda l over d. So I just substituted in sine theta equals y over l and then solved for y. Um, and the dark spots occur at position 
y n equals n plus a half lambda l over d. So in truth, actually, um, n, n goes from, it's, uh, it's a tilde, it's, it's approximately equal to, sorry. Um, good call. Um, so n, n starts counting from, or n is any integer. But if we're looking for small angles, that means small values of y. So we should be looking at small integers, somewhere between maybe negative 3 and positive 3. So if you want to look for the bright spot in the middle, you would plug in y equals, or uh, sorry, n equals 0. And so you would get a bright spot occurring in the middle when y equals 0. If you're looking for a dark spot, well, if you plug in n equals 0, what uh, the, the zero dark spots, there's uh, the zero dark spot, depending on how you start counting, um, is, will occur slightly to the right of the, uh, of the central, central, bright, central bright spot, slightly, at a slightly higher value of y. Because if you plug in n equals 0 here, you get lambda over 2 times l over d. And so the idea here is just that you can um, map out precisely where the bright and dark spots are just based off of the integers. So the only, the only thing left to, uh, or I guess there's two, two things left to say. So first is, what is the spacing? Between the fringes. And we'll call these things fringes because that's the shape that not fringles. <laughs> well, we can just figure what is the distance between two bright spots. That would be delta y. And you can just plug in n equals 2 minus n equals 1 uh, in, for y sub n. And you'll find that it's always the same. It's lambda l over d. That is the distance between, the, between um, bright spots that are close to the axis. If they're far away, this is all out the water because this approximation fails. But once, once you're, if you're looking at the distance between, say, the central bright spot and the next one over, this approximation is totally fine. Um, however, there is something to note. There is a, <coughs> just another fact, there is a finite number of bright spots. Right, you can't just keep increasing n in that formula, uh, in the formula, because eventually that formula fails to work. Because once um, the angle gets large, i.e., once the value of y gets large, the approximation fails. Um, so why is there a finite number of, of bright spots? Well, let's go and look back at the original formula for the bright spots. This is d sine theta equals n lambda. We know. We know that the absolute value of sine of theta is less than or equal to 1, right? That's just a true statement. Sine of theta can never be bigger than 1, can never be less than negative 1. And that implies that negative d is less than or equal to d sine theta, which is less than or equal to positive d. That's just how inequalities work and how absolute values work. But d sine theta, we know things about. d sine theta for bright spots is equal to n lambda. So that tells us that negative d has to be less than or equal to n lambda, which is less than or equal to d. So that, what that does is it puts a constraint on the possible values of n. Rearranging one more time, we get that negative d over lambda is less than or equal to n, which is less than or equal to d over lambda. And so what you can do is you can figure out how many bright spots and how many, or how many bright spots are there. Um, say d is, uh, Say d is 20 micrometers. And let's say that the wavelength of the thing we're worried with, or we're working with, is 500 nanometers. That's greenish light. Um, d divided by lambda, d being the spacing between the slits, it's 20 nano, 20, uh, let me just do an example. 20 micrometers, that's 20 millionths of a meter. Uh, and lambda is 500 nanometers. So uh, again, greenish, greenish blue, really. Um, so the question is, is how many slits or how many bright spots are there? Well, uh, d over lambda in that case 
<clears throat> is 40, right? Because there's a thousand nanometers in a micrometer. Um, and so if you multiply lambda by two, you get a thousand and then you need another factor of 20 to get up to D. So D over lambda is 40, which means that we have the inequality negative 40 is less than or equal to n, which is less than or equal to 40. So that means in this case, there are a total of 81 bright spots. It's not just 80 because there's also one at zero, right? So this tells us the range on the values of n that are possible uh, where we get constructive and destructive interference. And just for the record, those bright spots occur at a very wide angle. Because remember, um, when d sine theta, or when sine of theta is approximately 1, that's when this, uh, this inequality is satisfied. So when n is 40, then d sine theta is equal to d. And so in that case, that means that sine of theta is equal to 1. And when sine of theta is equal to 1, that means that theta is pi over 2, or 90 degrees. So that would be like saying um, you have your double slit here. You have your screen, and then way off in the distance, or let's actually, let's make our screen hemispherical. There we go. That would mean that we have a bright spot here coming from both of these. And you'd also have another bright spot on the other side, 90 degrees away, or 180 degrees away. And so in most cases, we won't detect that just because you need a very, very bright sources to see those. Uh, because the intensity tends, for, for any, any slits that are finite in width, like less than, not, not the distance between the finite and width, and again, we'll talk about this later, um, you get that the spots drop off intense at, in intensity as you get further and further away. So you would have bright spots maybe here, 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 and then you'll have 40 of them. And so, so the point is, is there's a finite number. There's a fixed number. They don't go on forever in whatever, in, in whatever direction. There's a fixed number. Um, <clears throat> So, OK, good, we're making good time. So that's great. We now know where the bright spots are, where the dark spots are. You're going to need this sort of um, material for your uh, homework, by the way. Um, so let's talk about the intensity pattern. Like, like, OK, we know that it's brightest at certain places and darkest at certain places, but how does the actual brightness change with position? Because it's not just points, right? It's not just like, if this is your screen, it's not like you just have points of bright and dark. They're blobs that have extent, and you just get the brightest points at, at a certain location and the darkest points at a certain location, but you get a smooth changing of brightness and darkness. So we need to talk about the intensity, the intensity pattern for the double slit. And by the way, we could have just as well talked about this with regards to sound. Uh, sound waves do all of the same things that we're talking about. But this is just an interesting phenomenon that we don't usually experience in, in everyday life uh, with light. And so it's useful, to, it's interesting to talk about it in the context of light. We actually are familiar, relatively familiar with this with regards to sound. So anyway, that's why it's interesting. So let's recall from a few lectures ago that the intensity of uh, the, the intensity between for, or for two interfering waves depends on the difference in overall phase. So the intensity at a spot with some overall phase or phase difference delta phi is equal to I naught times cosine squared of delta phi over two. So remember that this is the phase difference. And in this case, it is the result of difference in path length. So one light, one light source travels further than the other light source. And so they'll have a difference in overall phase at that particular position. So this tells us the intensity at a particular spot on our screen, effectively. And uh, this I naught, this is the maximum intensity. This is the intensity that you get when you have constructively, sorry, constructive interference. So this is this, the intensity of maximum brightness. So just as a quick note, a reminder from earlier, delta phi is equal to 2 pi delta x over lambda, which is 
2 pi d sine theta over lambda. And so what we get is a formula. This is, I promise, this is not the nastiest formula in this course. It actually gets way worse, and we'll see that on Monday or, when, or next week on Wednesday. Um, this is equal to i naught cosine squared of pi d sine theta over lambda. So it's weird to have like a sine inside of a cosine, but it just is how it works out. And so what we find for small angles which is equivalent to small values. Remember, y is the displacement on the screen. So this is for small values of y. We get the following formula for intensity. i of y is equal to i, or i naught, times cosine of theta, cosine squared, sorry, of pi times y times d divided by lambda times l. So it's just cosine of something. So what our intensity pattern looks like is the following. You have your double slit over here. And I'm going to draw the intensity as a graph uh, relative to y. So if that's 0. So it looks like this. It's hard to draw well. And all of those bumps are supposed to be equally spaced. This is the intensity pattern. So in the center, you'll have a bright spot. And that's what we would, have, we would have observed if my laser had worked. I mean, you saw the central bright spot, but it's not the same thing. And then you would have observed another equally bright spot, slightly, per, or slightly above or viewed from the, from the reference point of the laser. It would be like so slightly to the left. You have another bright spot of equal intensity even further to the left, another one even further to the left. And then similarly, you have the same picture going to the right. Now, this approximation, uh, basically, this is just a graph of this function that I drew. This is only true for small values of y. So really, what happens if you had plugged in theta, and then you had measured theta this way, what, what actually happens is that these, these uh, areas of, of uh, brightness get wider and wider as you go further out to infinity. And so in that sense, you have a finite number, because even though they get infinitely far away, the, uh, the width of the bright spots get infinitely long um, as you get, or, and the width of the dark spots also get equally long. Um, and so, so for arbitrary theta, let me draw another picture. And let me draw this larger. You'll get the central bright spot, which is never changes size. But you'll get that the width starts to change fairly early, depending on you know, how small the angles are and so on. And so they'll get wider and wider as you, uh, as, as you go further and further out. But the intensity, in theory anyway, assuming you have ideal um, double slits, the intensity never changes. It just gets more and more spread out. Um, Right. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover today. Let me verify that uh, I don't, I think that you should have everything in the homework for this. I don't think I started diffraction gratings, but let me just double check really quick so I can say something before everybody leaves. Um, um, double checking. Oh yeah, yeah, you, yeah. So, so you, so I won't need to change the homework. Everything on the homework is doable from today's lecture. Um, it, it might be challenging. That's certainly true, but it, it is doable. Right. So um, we have like fifteen-ish minutes left. Um, more time would have it would have taken more time if we had uh, been able to do a laser demo, but apparently that didn't work. Um, so we could either proceed on with more material, or I can just stop and I can ask if you guys have any questions, because you didn't ask a whole lot of questions, even though we went through a lot of math. So why not I uh, get questions from you? Yeah, so um, I'll probably hold office hours just because, because I know you guys might need help with homework. 
So yeah, I'll have office hours. Let me stop. Let me stop recording.